Paddy. Name and organisation. Uh, Sorry, Paddy. Paddy, Paddy Tien, president, president of the Irish Wind Energy Association. Could I say, Minister, thank you very much for what you said about renewables, which I thought really set the scene for where renewables can go forward from Ireland in a European context. Um, I think what you have said covers both the onshore dimension in terms of the projects that are getting built at the moment and which are very important in their own right. The, what you said about major onshore and then which uh, is now becoming an increasing priority of the Irish Wind Energy Association uh, offshore. Uh, you mentioned the whole issue of jobs. And just to make one suggestion uh, is that I think the experience of the UK in recent times when they announced their offshore initiative shows that the whole supply chain and what can be delivered in the supply chain with a clear statement from government as to how they are going to develop forward, in this case, the renewable sector. I think that would be really important and would be a very welcome addition to what you had to say. Thank you, Minister. Would you like to respond to Minister? Well, if you want to take a few, I mean, I, I, yes, I'll I, I respond to Paddy. I mean, yeah. um, uh, um, in terms of of onshore, I mean, I think everybody is is is, is fairly familiar with uh, the record and the potential there, and the fact that the refit uh, refit uh, two has been approved and has been approved by government. Uh, it's got state aid's clearance and been approved by government, and it's uh, it's uh, it's presumably on our website already um, uh, in terms of uh, of, of uh, inviting applications. Um, in terms of, of offshore, I mean, uh, Paddy will be aware, and some other people here will be aware, that we've had a, a number of discussions with uh, our British counterparts. Uh, and I think we've probably taken them as far as we can take them for the moment, because the British are engaged in their own internal consultation process at the moment, which will very quickly conclude because it has kind of reached the stage where we need to start to talk about the nuts and bolts of what would constitute an intergovernmental agreement. Up to now, there has been a lot of polite shadow boxing and various things, uh, you know, round and about uh, aspirational statements and all that kind of thing. And during the course of all this uh, intellectual ferment, Charles Hindry told me he managed to pick up a castle in Scotland. And, will no doubt be looking at the wind flows there while he's uh, out shooting grouse. But uh, he is, I think, uh, personally committed to the notion of an intergovernmental uh, uh, <coughs> agreement with Ireland. Um, there's some rethink, I think, going on within the present British government. Uh, and the, the Energy Secretary, uh, um, uh, Chris Hewn, has, has, uh, the Environment Secretary, has left the government recently. And I don't know what will come out of the, the present uh, uh, consultation. But the next engagement really has to be about what would be the shape of such an intergovernmental agreement that would govern the kind of export possibilities that you're talking about, uh, and so on. Supply chain. Um, I think it's next week I'm meeting the IDA, and this is one of the questions that we're going to talk to them about. I mean, uh, you know, uh, you, you have to, I think, be able to demonstrate uh, an export potential uh, before, you know, we're, we're seriously in the business of the supply chain operating from this island that would service that. And we have to look at that and you know, uh, it, it, uh, it, it does pose, there are a couple of projects that are, are examining the possibilities of locating in Ireland. Whether any of them will actually happen, I don't know. But it is something that will be on the agenda, I think, next week is our meeting with the IDA. Thank you very much, Minister. Now, because it's such a large crowd, uh, and uh, we may have a lot of people who want, wish to ask questions, I'll start with taking two questions at a time, and please confine them to questions rather than speeches. So, okay. Sorry, less spaghetti there. Okay. And remember, 
name and affiliation. Thank you very much. I'm the ambassador of Finland and my name is Perti Majanen. And everybody will, after this, remember my name, <laughs> as you guess. Uh, Mr. Minister, thank you very much for your friend presentation. And in your presentation, you already underlined the importance of the energy efficiency. This is a very topical question also for the reason that the Euro European Commission is uh, preparing a draft dry directive, or is it, it is ready already and being discussed in the parliament. And there are many, many important proposals in this directive, including the, the obligation to reach the 1.5 reduction, energy reduction uh, every year. Uh, I'm uh, mainly asking uh, uh, you to clarify or uh, describe the overall uh, Irish position concerning the new directive and uh, which way we are going at the at the moment and is especially your opinion on this 1.5 object objective there is also a discussion very important discussion concerning the reference year when we start comparing these reductions and this is 2011 at the moment and and uh, there are very uh, strong differences in opinions. And one more thing is that uh, this process is getting very complicated for the reason that there are these 2,000 uh, amendment propo proposals by the European Parliament at the moment. So thank you very much. Thank you. And a second question. Sorry, uh, Frank Groom, Airgrid. Uh, Minister, I wanted you to comment on your position regarding uh, any proposed increase in the renewable targets, both in the European contracts and you know, what effect that will have here on your willingness to increase the renewable targets going forward, post-2020, obviously. Okay, thank you. Yeah, well, um, I, I, I can tell the ambassador that, yes, we're very supportive of the uh, objectives in the Energy Efficiency Directive. Uh, it seems to me that one of the, one of the few things that we can meaningful do, meaningfully do is reduce consumption. Um, our experience of dipping our toe in the water in terms of retrofit and uh, so on, you know, would bear that out. Indeed, there's also a target in the Energy Efficiency Directive about the retrofit of public buildings. And we certainly have tremendous capacity in that area in this country. Um, yes, you're right, there are strong differences of opinion. Uh, as a result, I think the Danes probably think that rather than um, complete a directive that they're not happy with, that it may well survive to the Irish presidency. Mm -hmm. And it may not be got over the line before then. Uh, but um, uh, that, that, that is our view. Um, well, it, we've been operating within the targets that are set. Uh, and um, I, I'm, uh, whereas I said in my remarks that I'm assured by expert opinion that we have the capacity to meet our targets from onshore and then with something to spare. Um, I don't think that that would necessarily drive me to reviving unilaterally, re revising unilaterally our targets. I'm more interested in looking at the issues that uh, have been raised with me by uh, the offshore wind people in terms of what the potential is there. I mean, uh, I should have said, um, in the interest of accuracy, when I said that the government has approved our proposals for uh, refit two for on for for onshore, uh, government uh, has not approved refit for offshore, and uh, there are reasons for that. I go into if need be, but I think people understand. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that the capacity about which Paddy Tehan spoke. Uh, that is there because we're richly endowed with these resources uh, that we shouldn't set about examining the capacity there for developing a, uh, an export market. And that's the big challenge of our discussions with the British. Thank you. Over here. Minister David Taylor, Energy Institute. Um, in the light of the very positive experiences we've had with agencies in this country, and I can think of two, for example, the IDA, and uh, with regard to industrial development and sustainable energy Ireland with regard to renewables development. Looking at hydrocarbons, which will continue to be important, and 
looking at carb and the emerging debate on shale gas. Are you minded to look at an agency approach, you know, where the promotion, if you like, would belong in one area and regulation and policy in another, uh, and thereby set out to inform the players, the public debate, and bring us, I would say, to a happier space when it comes to achieving your ultimate objective of development and resource development? Yeah, there's another one down here at the back. Minister, thank you for your contribution. Uh, Grattan Healy is the name. Um, two points. One is about uh, Grattan Healy, a board of SAI and various other hats, uh, wind associations and so on. Um, Minister, uh, two things. I'm delighted to hear you, you believe we'll meet our targets, but uh, given what's going on with the curtailment issue, um, we really, really need to address that. There was a meeting of the SCM committee yesterday with the wind industry. We're waiting for an outcome as to how they will approach the subject, but it is the wind is pretty much a consensus in the wind industry that the, the government or the, the department will need to do something about the refit scheme to, to solve the curtailment problem. And I'm wondering, would you comment on that? And the second point is I'd be interested in your thinking behind the constitutional claim to wind energy um, in, your, in your address. I'm wondering what the implications of that are, if I might. Thanks. Well, the implications, Grattan, is not to put you out of business. Uh, uh, it is merely to remind the audience of uh, what the, is stated in the Constitution and that whatever measures and whichever direction we go in in the future, that uh, you know, it, it has to be for uh, the benefit of the, the people of this country and so on. And uh, you know, we have managed to uh, reasonably successfully in a market economy ride the uh, challenge between the Constitution and um, nurturing the uh, market economy. Um, I'd be interested in talking uh, to you, David, uh, about that idea. I mean, uh, if I fully understand you, uh, I mean, of course, hydrocarbons are uh, important and are going to continue to be important. Uh, there's, there, there's no disputing uh, that. I suppose. It's in the area of shale gas that it probably arises more dramatically, uh, or more sharply anyway, in terms of the division of responsibilities to which you refer. Um, you know, uh, it, um, the, the debate is one way so far. Um, you know, um, even though there isn't any hydraulic fracturing going on in this country, you know, um, one would get the contrary impression from the depth of feeling being expressed in different parts of the country, including a meeting I saw um, on television last night um, uh, in Carrick and Shannon, I think it was. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not that the technology here is new, but the phenomenon of shale gas is new in this country, as I understand it. Uh, and. In terms of separateness, I mean, the, the, the three companies were awarded licenses to do initial exploration work and desktop study and all that kind of thing. Uh, but if they go to the next phase or seek to go to the next phase, I mean, it has to go through a very rigorous environmental impact assessment process and all the rest that goes with that. If it's an offshore hydrocarbon, it has to go through a planning process and all the rest and so on. Um, you, you know, that, that what, what, would, what would a separate agency bring to the party? Um, as I say, I would be interested in talking to you about that. I mean, obviously the shale gas one is, is, um, is uh, causing a, a lot of concern. Now, whether that concern is stoked up on evidence-based information is something that it's too early to say. Um, you know, we, we certainly don't yet have the expert advice that would enable me to be satisfied that I could make a call on it one way or the other. Uh, even in the United States, uh, I think the EPA study in the United States has taken some four years, 
and I presume when that emerges this year, it'll be a major, uh, a major contribution uh, to this document. I think it wasn't helped in the United States by um, the intervention of the former uh, vice president who managed to uh, push through legislation that exempted fracking from any of the normal uh, uh, checks and balances that would normally have applied. It's referred to in the States as the, the Halliburton loophole. And uh, that hasn't, you know, uh, enhanced um, public support for, for the process. But certainly I'd be very glad to, uh, to talk to you about would, uh, would a separate agency dividing the functions uh, make it more efficient and um, less problematic for me? Uh, I, I, I don't know. Grattan, I know your views very well on curtailment. And uh, as you know, we're, we're discussing that. Um, uh, I, honestly, I honestly couldn't um, agree with your use of the word consensus uh, in the industry, because I have to say that uh, different players in the industry have represented uh, somewhat different views uh, to me on it. But I read your paper. I don't know whether that paper was published or not. And uh, I must say I found it very informative uh, and uh, a very accessible and, and lucid account of, um, of the entire issue. Uh, I'm not sure that I would agree with the we'll all be ruined, says Hanrahan, before the year is out conclusion. Uh, uh, but it, I know that um, the curtailment issue uh, is and has been represented to me uh, by different uh, by different interests in the in the industry, and we're looking at it, Grattan. That's that's all I can say to you. I'm not trying to delay on it or anything like that. Uh, we have additional problems on our plate as a result of a more recent SIM decision, uh, which certainly came as a major surprise to me, and I think to most in the industry. Uh, so we have to have a look at that as well, but. I don't want to stick my oar into that until I uh, find out a bit more about it. And my understanding is that the industry is engaging with SIM at the moment. I don't know if that process has started yet or not. Thanks, Minister. Uh, Ronan Tynan, a member of the Institute. Uh, first of all, Minister, thanks very much for a, a presentation that clearly is focused on jobs and growth and a very challenging brief you have. My focus very much is from the ICT sector, though, in fairness as a perspective, and I was delighted that you mentioned energy, ICT, and innovation is also an area where there are clearly major opportunities. In fact, I'd even suggest to you that the security sector is one that in this area may also have a lot of potential. Is this the way I want to ask your question? I mean, it certainly probably isn't the first thing a minister for energy would be uh, briefed on, but the whole question of cyber threats in the electric area is getting a lot of media play. Anybody who follows this will be quite surprised, actually, and the reason, of course, is, is doing research in this area myself at the moment, is these threats seem to become far more uh, serious with time and perhaps the reason we haven't had a problem is because those in the industry have been doing a reasonable job in, in meeting that challenge. So one, I was curious to know, are you aware of that? Is it an issue that you're concerned about? Do you find your fellow ministers in this area concerned about it? Is it an issue that you think should get more airplay? Is getting more airplay? For example, Ireland's infrastructure in the cybersecurity area is not really perhaps as obvious as it is in other countries with institutions appointed, a lot of emphasis even on the military side and so forth. So. Uh, just to throw that at you, I mean, obviously, one doesn't want to be the first minister, I'm sure, to have that problem. And luckily, despite the, I will admit, the airplay or the attention this gets, we still haven't had a major, well, in fairness, there have been some attacks on electric networks. But I'm just curious, really, as to your perspective on that issue. Is it something you've noticed on your agenda? Thanks very much indeed. Um, Brian Britton, uh, National Officer, Wind Association. Um, Minister, it would be remiss of me if I didn't say here today that your decision on the offshore refit has put the offshore industry back by one or two years. However, we very much welcome the, uh, as Paddy has said earlier on, on behalf of the Irish Wind Energy Association, your commitment to uh, engaging with our neighbours in the UK and uh, the focus on an intergovernmental agreement between uh, the two countries. I would also like to ask you, uh, that as part of the discussions that are taking place as directed by the EU to encourage uh, trade between EU member states, that we're also looking at a market mechanism so that if uh, Hungary or Czech Republic or whatever are short of renewable energy, we have a major resource here that we should be seeking to supply to those states 
and I would like uh, your commitment that that will be pursued at European level. And finally, in the context of um, moving forward, is it possible to look at public-private partnerships as we move forward, uh, particularly when you meet with the agencies, because many companies in this country have invested a lot of money in the offshore industry, uh, and we need to work very closely with the agencies to capitalise on the supply chain opportunities that uh, are, they're affording. Um, uh, thanks, uh, Ronan. Um, we really haven't uh, we really haven't resolved on a list of priorities for our own presidency yet. I mean, a great deal will depend on where the current presidency uh, finishes up and so on. Whether, as the uh, Finnish ambassador says, the energy efficiency directive is still there, uh, the infrastructure package uh, is clearly priority. And I mentioned the uh, energy ICT interaction because we have some competitive advantage in this country in the ICT area. Now, unfortunately, the bad news I have for you is that, yes, indeed, I am the first minister to be landed with the cybersecurity uh, responsibility. It has been recently passed over uh, to me from the Taoiseach's department. And um, uh, beware of, of Greeks bearing gifts. Uh, so. Uh, Yes, um, uh, we are uh, attempting in the unit to put together some skills in that area. I don't know about your suggestion about more airplay. I think their whole existence is designed not to get too much airplay uh, and all the rest. But yes, I am aware of it. And uh, yes, we are uh, attempting to, uh, uh, to cope as best we can. I would agree with your remarks that the industry has been doing a, a a relatively fine job in, in the area so far and so on. I understand, Brian, you're disappointed, and uh, I, I accept that in, entirely, and uh, I know the amount of work um, that you have invested in it, and, and I know that your investors as well, um, um, you know, uh, uh, put, a, put a lot into it. Um, the decision was made for a number of reasons, uh, cost being a Cost imposed on consumers, uh, cost especially imposed on business and large enterprise users, I mean, very close to the top, and uh, so on. We're in extraordinary straightened circumstances, and I know I needn't dwell on that point to this audience, but we are at the moment in such very difficult circumstances. All, all I can say to you is that I'm very anxious to progress the discussions. Uh, with uh, my British counterpart and my assessment of his uh, convictions uh, are similar. I, I think he wants to do likewise. And, um, you know, any doors that we can open uh, for you or that haven't been opened already, uh, you know, we're very anxious to help in that regard. Um, uh, the public-private partnerships is something probably that we should discuss in the context of the next white paper on this area. I mean, in the interim, uh, because we have made the decision we have made on offshore refit doesn't mean to say that the department and the agencies that are there will not try to be as helpful as we can uh, to your <laughs> sector of the industry as best we can. Thank you very much, Minister. Far corner on the right. Anybody else queuing up? Another one here, right? Our Minister, thanks very much. This is most useful today. Um, Dan Hanavig, uh, of, of, like Grattan, a variety of different hats. Uh, one of those that uh, actually achieved the issuance of the guarantees of origin. We are the, the very first in the country who has actually had them issued. We are ready to trade when the, when the, when the UK side are ready to receive. So, uh, you know, we'll be patient and we understand the, the process that is going through. And if it is achieved within the time scale of the of the expiry of the of the guarantees of origin, that would be most welcome indeed. Separately, um, there's a feeling here, a drift of thought, that uh, the very very large energy store, which I think we all know about, is a bit of a slam dunk. And um, would the minister be kind enough to bring it in competition? in energy store to the point where the full measure of its uh, various different devices uh, of scale uh, could significantly enhance the performance on the grid. 
this in itself will substantially change the, the curtailment issue because the higher the firm base of synchronous com uh, generating on the system, the higher the 50% at the, at the current cutoff point will be. And it's actually quite important to, to move quickly into these uh, uh, energy storage devices that also provide significant grid services. Thanks. Thanks very much, Chairman. Matt Dempsey, Farmers Journal. Minister, was it a coincidence or did I, did I miss your non-referral to biomass in any form? Thank you. Sorry, the first question was asked. Well, uh, I don't want to reaffirm, Dan, you know, we're, we're as anxious as you are in terms of the uh, in terms of the relationship with Britain. Now, some of uh, your, major, your remaining question about energy storage and so on is, as the late Seamus Brennan said about the Dublin Port Tunnel, away above my head. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we, we, we should talk about it and uh, see, uh, see whether we're in agreement or not. No, you're right, Matt. Um, you're right. It, it's a complete coincidence, a uh, complete omission. Um, uh, we have the new refit in place, refit three, uh, since last week or the previous week for uh, biomass. And uh, I'm aware of uh, a few interesting projects in the pipeline in that regard. Um, I, was, I attended the, um, the um, bioenergy conference last week, and again, we had some very interesting discussions in this area. Um, I suppose, you know, it, it comes into the section of the, the, my remarks, you know, where I was dealing with the state participation and state land and state companies, you know, probably also need to get some clarification there you know, about whether this is the best way that they're organized. Um, the new, new, new Era Authority is established now, and one of its roles is as shareholder executive. Um, I would imagine that it will examine whether the present configuration of the organization of state companies, you know, is, the, if, is that the most, is that the most uh, efficient. I, um, uh, I, I was going to say something there, Chairman. I forgot I was on the record. Um, <laughs> um, the, the, um, uh, the, the point is, anyway, that eventually Refit 3 came through. And I think you know, most of the uh, small companies represented at the conference last week you know, uh, seemed to signal that that was the green light for them to proceed. Now, whether there is greater capacity in that area, you and the Farmer's Journal and your uh, avid readers would probably know more about it than I do. I mean, there are questions about, you know, the future of agriculture after the present regime ends. And that gives rise to certain questions as well. You know, no longer, as you know, will we have a sugar quota and so on. And, so forth, and you know some of the some of the possibilities that might arise there. I know that uh, Simon Coveney, for example, is is interested in that, and uh, we're look at, we're looking at it together uh, in terms of the bioenergy area. So it is only a coincidence uh, or an omission, rather, that it's not in the script. Uh, it is not that I don't think that it's, uh, albeit smaller, but very important contribution uh, on the renewable side. Thanks, Minister. Any final question? I think we're, we're coming to the end. One here. Is there another one that we want to group with us? Just one? Two. OK. Uh, good Can afternoon, I, Minister. Yes. Just a point of clarification. John McNamara of A&M. In relation to uh, Refit 2, you mentioned it had stated clearance and passed by Cabinet, and that it was on the website. Is that open for applications? I may, be, I, I may be wrong about it being on the website, but if it isn't, it will be. It was approved by Cabinet on Tuesday. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's just a question of doing the, the necessary mechanical work to get it. Lovely. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, and there was one. Uh, 
Sweeney Minister from SEI. Uh, just, just to I, don't, I understand what you, you've said about uh, refit for offshore wind and so on. I just want to ask: is is there um, is it open uh, to consider? Uh, Would you like to stand up so that we? Oh, can... sorry. Or... Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, is it open to consider um, uh, sort of refit as a more complex instrument of being capped and at certain levels and, and so on? I, I'm thinking particularly as an incentivization to, to enterprise development and specifically in the case of wave and tidal, which are not likely to produce any, any um, sort of a charge on the, on the taxpayer for quite a number of years to come. But, but to think of it as a, as a form of, uh, of, of incentivizing early stage uh, development and, and small-scale project development here. I, is, that, is that still open? I mean, I, I can understand the resistance to make to commitments to large impositions on, on, the, on the consumer, but, but REFET, I think, may have a role as a kind of an incentivization policy for technology and industry development. I'm just wondering, is that still open as a topic? Well, the REFET just agreed uh, the REFIT just agreed on, as you know, started life in 2010. Uh, and in fact, uh, the projects go back to 2010 and so on. So any question of redesigning it uh, would have uh, produced a delay of a further 12 months uh, or so, and so on. So that wasn't clearly feasible. I mean, I don't have any, um, it's a fairly arcane science. I, I don't have any uh, preconceptions about <coughs> looking at what happens after 2015. Uh, in terms of redesign and so on, uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm quite willing to to take expert advice uh, on it. Uh, I mean, in the ocean energy sector, I don't understand that to be an issue that confronts me today or tomorrow. There are other issues that conf confront me in terms of maintaining uh, maintaining the research effort that is going on in that area. And uh, I visited um, I visited. Um, uh, IMARC uh, last week at, at, at Hall Bolin and so on, and uh, you know, certainly some very impressive work going on there. And I'm going to uh, UCG um, UCG next week uh, to talk to, to them, amongst other things, about that particular subject. So the, the the main effort is to ensure that somewhere we find the money to ensure that the research work going on in an area that we may well have some advantages in. Personally, I think we have. Uh, in the future is protected. But I think the, uh, the design of uh, future feed-in tariffs or whatever is certainly something that's open and that we should be prepared to look at. I mean, up to now, I mean, the representations being made to me by the industry is to the effect that they need to get their full whack out of the existing system, uh, you know, in order to be able to remunerate investment. And uh, you know there are some critical metrics if we were going to uh, to tackle redesigning it. But in principle, I'm not opposed at all to looking at that. Okay. 